Today, I will show you guys my Calculus 1, Exam 3. And this test is on min max values, min value theorem, first and second derivative tests, Lapidus rule, optimizations, and also related rates. And as always, you guys can go download this file in the description and try the questions first before you watch the video. We have a total of 17 questions. And let's go ahead and get started with number one. We are going to find the absolute maximum value of the function f of x is equal to x to the fifth power minus 5x plus 3 on the interval negative 1 comma 3. First of all, I will show you guys the easy way to do this. It's a multiple choice question. So we can just go ahead and use our TI-84 graphing calculator and just go ahead and graph it. And if you do that, you will end up with a picture that looks like this. And then you hit second calc and all that. And you will see we do have a minimum right here. Negative 1 for the x value and then the y value is 7. So the answer is just 7. And be careful. When we are trying to find the absolute max, it's the absolute maximum y value. So the answer is 7. So not negative 1. All right. And of course, if you want to do it with our calculator, be my guest as well. First, we take the derivative. So we get... 5x to the fourth power minus 5 and then we are going to set this equal to 0 to find the critical numbers solve this equation we will get x is equal to plus or minus 1 you just move this to the other side divide it both sides by 5 x to the fourth power is equal to 1 implies x is equal to plus or minus 1 so these are the critical numbers and then we just have to check the value of the function at the critical numbers and also the endpoints so let's check f of 1. You plug in 1 into the original. So you get 1 to the 5th power minus 5 times 1 plus 3. We will get 1 minus 4, which is... No, 1 minus 5, which is negative 4, plus 3 is negative 1. Then we go ahead and do f of negative 1. This right here is negative 1 to the 5th power minus 5 times negative 1 and then plus 3. And if you work that out, we will get 7. And lastly, we check negative 3 right here. The 1 is already <laughs> checked already, so that's good. So f of negative 3, this right here is negative 3 to the 5th minus 5 times negative 3 plus 3. So in this case, we'll end up with negative 1 to 25 plus 15 and then plus 3. So that's negative 110 plus 3. That will give us negative 107 negative 110 plus 3. Yeah. All right, so this means the biggest value here, which is that, and that will be the absolute max. And in the meantime, we also know the absolute min. So let me also indicate this for you guys. So that's how you find the extreme values of a function on an interval. Now we use a calculator, much easier that way too. All right, number two, we are going to find the interval on which our function f of x is equal to x to the third power minus 3x squared, that we want it to be concave up. So how do we get a concave up? Remember, this is the case when the second derivative is equal to 0. That's how we do it, right? So let's just go ahead and take the derivative twice. So f prime of x, this right here is 3x squared minus 6x. And then do it again, f double prime of x, this right here is 6x minus 6. And because this is just a linear right 6x to the first power minus 6 just go ahead and set this greater than 0 and then just solve it the usual way and we'll get x is greater than 1 which implies the interval 1 to infinity b if this right here is not linear inequality then i will suggest you guys to find out the numbers that will make it equal to 0 and then do the number line test to find out the sign positive and negative just in case then that's the safe way to do it but anyway though, here we have this question. So to keep in mind, we have the first 10 questions, multiple choice questions. All right. Number three. Here we are given the function f of x is equal to 1 over x on the interval 1, 4. Find all the numbers c so that we satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So what is the mean value theorem? Let me remind you. We are going to get 
the derivative of the function as some value c and the c is on the interval that we have. This right here is equal to the slope connecting the endpoints. The slope of the line connecting the endpoint. So it's like this. And of course here our a is 1 and b is equal to 4. And now let's just go ahead and do the usual thing. So let's go ahead and do the derivative part. So our function is 1 over x, which is x to a negative 1. Take the derivative, and we get the first derivative being negative x to the negative 2, which is negative 1 over x squared. And notice right here I put down c, because that kind of satisfies the question, right? c, but if you put down x inside and answer the question, that's OK too. But anyway, though, I'll write it as negative 1 over c squared. That will be equal to, here, we need to get f of b, which is just f of 4. So I'll just say f of b, which is just f of 4, and that's equal to 1 over 4. And f of a, which is f of 1, and that's just 1 over 1, which is 1. So we have 1 over 4 minus 1 over 4 minus 1. And then simplify it whichever way that you would like. Uh, perhaps I will just multiply the top and bottom by 4 real quick. And then just worked out the numbers. We get negative 1 over c squared equals. On the top, we will get negative 3. And then on the bottom, we will get 12. So altogether, we get negative 1 over 4. So this is negative 1 over 4. Both sides has negative, so just cancel them out. And both of them on the top is just 1, so that means c squared has to be equal to 4. That means c has to be plus or minus 2. But the interval is 1, 4, and technically it should be the close interval. It should be the open interval, sorry. Um, what do we pick? We only choose c equals 2 because this is the one that's on the interval 1, 4. So, E is the answer. Number four, here's a classic tricky question. We are given the derivative graph, all right? So this right here is y is equal to f prime of x. And we are going to find the local minimum of the original. So here, the answer is not zero. A lot of people just say, hey, this is the minimum. No, because we're given the derivative and we're trying to find the minimum of the original. So how do we do it? Well, whenever we have to get the local minimum, we can use the first derivative test. This is where our first derivative changes signs and changes from negative to positive. Because this will tell you the graph will be going down and then go up, right? for the original. But again, we are given f prime of x already. So you have to keep in mind that anything below the x-axis is negative. Anything above the x-axis is positive. So where is this graph changes from negative to positive? As we can see, it's right here. right? It goes from negative to positive at x equals 2. And this is the only place that happens. The answer is d. Number 5. Given a graph, same graph, but this time, again, it's still the derivative, but we have to find the point of inflection of the original. So keep all this in mind. Hmm, so it looks like there's no point of inflection, but keep in mind, this is the derivative graph, all right? So how do we do it? Well, let me remind you. For the point of inflection, this right here is where our second derivative changes signs. And it can go from negative to positive or positive to negative, doesn't matter. However, though, uh, how do we get the second derivative from the first derivative? Well, we have to look for the slope of the tangent line, right? So this right here is pretty much saying we have to look for the slope of the first derivative in order to get the second derivative. So in fact, where the slope is equal to 0 is right here. 
this right here, the slope of our f prime is equal to zero. That means the second derivative of the original is equal to zero. And it does change sign because it was negative slope earlier and then now it's positive slope afterward, right? So the answer is when x is equal to zero. So C. All right, continue. Number six. Here we are given the original graph, like finally, right? But we are going to sketch the graph for f prime of x. So this is how I like to suggest my students to do it. Go ahead and draw the x and y axis line up and be careful. So keep in mind the tangent horizontal, horizontal tangent segment like this. This is where the slope is equal to zero. And if you have 45 degrees, this is the slope is equal to one. And if you have this, the slope is equal to negative one. And of course, when I say slope, they tell it's the derivative. These are just the tangent segments. See? But it looks that we don't have any place that the slope is equal to zero. So let's go for ne one and negative one. There's no one actually. So let's say maybe right here, the slope is about like 45 degrees, right? So it's negative one. So I will go down here and then, you see, I just kind of line up and then I will replace, I will place negative one, right? Because this value is about negative one right here. But of course we can only estimate, so I'm not going to write down the number. Similarly, perhaps right here, you can see that the tangent segment also has a slope negative one. So I'll come down here and then again line up and then have a point right here. Now I'll move out a little bit, I say right here, you'll see that this is about negative one half. So I'll come here and it's going to be closer to the x axis. So it will be something like this. Likewise, maybe somewhere right here. If you trace down, this right here is closer to the x axis, so like this. And notice if you move towards zero, you see that the slope going is going to get steeper and steeper in a negative way, right? It's going to go down. So you will see this right here is going to go downward more. Likewise here is going to go downward more. And now you can just connect the dots. In fact, when x is equal to zero, when x is equal to zero here, we have a vertical tangent line and the slope there is undefined. But if you approach zero, you get negative infinity. So the picture will look like this. Something like that. And uh, we choose the best answer, which is A. So that's how the graph looks like. Done. And if you recognize the equation for this, I will tell you though, in fact, f of x, this is negative cube root of x. And then you can, of course, take the derivative from this by the power rule and then graph it on your graphing calculator. And I'm going to leave that to you. Okay, number seven, which of the following is true? And this, we have limits. So go ahead, think about it first before you continue watch the video. Ready? Okay, I'll tell you, the answer is D. Why? Because right here, I will use my secret weapon. I call this the list, which says as x goes to infinity, we know ln x is the smallest kind of infinity. Next, we have x to a piece power. Next, we have exponential b to the x and then x to the x. And the small detail for this is that p has to be greater than one and b has to be greater than zero. And here, what we have is ln x, which is the smaller one here, divided by e to the x, which is the big one here. And if you're using the list, either you get zero or infinity. All right, so small divided by big, you get zero. And now let's also go fix the other limits. For the first one, we have x to the power, the smaller one, compared to e to the x, the big one. So the answer should have been zero. Next, we have x minus ln x. And this is like x to the first power, which is right here, minus the smaller one, which is ln x. In this case, we have a much bigger infinity minus a smaller infinity. You get infinity. It's so easy if you use the list, <laughs> trust me. C, this is a tricky one. The answer is not one, but rather we have E, 
which is about 2.718. You can use a graphing calculator gra to graph this, and you will see the horizontal asymptote is around 2.718 or something. But be really careful though, if you just plug in infinity into all the axes, you get 1 to the infinity's power. But this is the classic limit, which I always emphasize this limit in my calculus classes. So make sure that you understand this limit's behavior really well. Okay, number A, we have a related rate question. The first one, first related rate on the test. Okay, here we have water running into a conical tank. And we have the rate at 9 feet cube per minute. And the tank stands point down and has a shape has a height of 15 feet and the base radius 5 feet. How fast is the water level rising when the water is 6 feet deep? All right, here's the secret of doing related rate questions. You draw two pictures so you can see what's going on. First of all, we are looking at the tank, right? So let's say the picture looks like this. Now draw to scale, of course. And let's go ahead and put on some labels. We know the base radius is 5, and uh, you don't have to write down the units because everything is feet, and all the units agree, so there's no tricks in this case, case here. So we have 5, and the height is 15, so we have the tank like this. And we have the water going into the tank, right? So of course, maybe at first we just have a little bit of water, let's say right here. And what's going to happen? Of course, when you have more water coming to the tank, the water level is going to go up. So the second picture, I will still give you guys the same tank because the tank will stay the same, right? The tank is not going to get bigger or smaller. But maybe the water is right now here. So notice, if you look at the blue part, the water is also in the shape of a cone because the water forms just like the tank. And the radius right here does change. And the height right here does change. All right. So they are, I'm just going to label them as variables R and H because they change over time. Okay. Now, as always, let's go ahead and put down what we know. Well, we are looking for the volume of a cone. So make sure that you know our volume formula. For the volume it is one third pi r squared times h. Keep that in mind. And what else do we know? If we go back here, it says the water is going to the tank at the rate of nine feet cube per minute. So this is the dv dt. The rate is the derivative, and in this case, it's the volume, right? The change, the rate of change of the volume of the water with respect to time. I'm just going to say this is equal to nine. And what do we want to know? Well, we want to find out how fast is the water level rising. So that will be the change of height right here. So we want dh dt at the instance when the water is 6 feet deep, so when h is equal to 6. So now, can we just go ahead and take the derivative? No, not so fast, because right here, notice how we have r and h. They both are functions of x. So you will have to use the product rule. And then we are going to get dh dt and also dr dt. Eh, we don't prefer that. Here is a class way to do this kind of question. Notice, if you go back to the picture right here, we have two triangles and they are similar. So we can use similar triangle to kind of reduce our computation a little bit. Let's look at the blue one. Right here, we have R and H. And let's look at the one for the tank, from the tank. So the black one right here. Here we have 15, and here we have 5. So what we can do is set up by using, by using similar triangles. We can say R over H. has to be equal to 5 over 15. And make sure that you do this in the correct order. So like this. 5 over 15 is just one third. 
And then from this equation, we can multiply both sides by h and say r is equal to one third h. And then we can put this expression into the r here, so we don't have to deal with r anymore. So that's the beauty. So we can look at v as one third pi and then r squared, and r is one third h. And then after that, we still have to multiply by an h. Let's simplify this before we take the derivative. One third squared is one over nine times one third again, so we get one over 27. And then we have the pi, h squared times one more h, so we have altogether h to the third power. And then we can look at this volume equation and take the derivative with respect to time. And this is going to give us dv dt, and that's equal to, well, here we are going to put the power to the front and then minus one, 3 over 27 is 1 over 9, and then we have the pi, and then h squared. But remember, h is the function of t, so we multiply by dh dt, and that's the chain rule part. Now with all this, we can just go ahead and plug in all the numbers that we have. So dv dt is equal to 9, and that's equal to 1 over 9 pi, and h is 6 and then square that, and then we have the dh dt. So this right here is 9 equals 36 over 9 is just 4, so we have 4 pi, and then dh dt. Divide both sides by 4 pi, we get dh dt equals 9 over 4 pi. And put this onto your calculator, and make sure that you enter 4 pi in the parentheses when you use a calculator and you will get approximately 0 0.716. And this is about the rate of change of the height, right? So it's feet per minute. And that's answer choice A. Done. If you guys want to see more examples on related rate, make sure you check out the other video, right? Uh, I'll also leave a comment down below for that. Next. At what x value are the points of inflection of the functions? So looking for the point of inflection and the functions ln of x squared plus 1. So of course, take the second derivative, right? So derivative and then derivative again. First derivative in action, whenever you take the derivative of ln, we put the bottom, we put the inside on the bottom first. So x squared plus 1, and then use the chain rule multiplied by the derivative of the inside, that's 2x. So that's the first derivative. Then take the second derivative, meaning we look at this and take the derivative. Use the quotient rule. Let's square the bottom first. So we have x squared plus 1. And then keep the bottom function x squared plus 1 times the derivative of the top, which is 2. Minus the top function, which is 2x, times the derivative of the bottom, which is 2x. And then simplify this, we get 2x squared plus 2 minus 4x squared over parentheses x squared plus 1 squared, which is negative 2x squared plus 2 over x squared plus 1 and then squared. Now we shall set this equal to 0 and make sure that the second derivative does change sign. And when we have this is equal to 0, all we care about is just the top being equal to 0. So we get negative 2x squared plus 2 is equal to 0. And then you can move this to the other side, divide both sides by negative 2 and take the square root on both sides. I will tell you x is equal to plus or minus 1. And these are the two numbers that we care. And make sure that they do have to work. In the sense that first, we can plug in negative 1 and 1 into the original function. Yes. Then we have to make sure that the second derivative does change its sign at negative 1 and 1. In fact, the domain of this function is all real numbers, meaning you can plug in any x values, uh, any real number into the x value. Any, x, any real number into the x. There. 
Anyway, pick a number less than negative 1, let's say negative 2, and then you put it into this expression. Work that out, you will get negative. And then if you pick a number between negative 1 and 1, let's say 0, and then you put it here, you will get positive. And then if you pick a number bigger than 1, let's say 2, put it here, you get negative. So the second derivative does change the sign at negative 1 and 1, meaning we do get point of inflection. So negative 1 and 1, C. Be careful though, sometimes if the question is very tricky, if the second derivative doesn't change sign, then you cannot say that's a point of inflection. Number 10, we are going to find out where is this function decreasing. Okay, so this means we want to get our first derivative to be less than zero. So let's go ahead and do our derivative f prime of x. When we do the inverse tangent, we get 1 over and then 1 plus whatever the inside is, and then we square that, right? So we get the x squared plus x. And then don't forget we multiply by the derivative of the inside because of the chain rule. So that's 2x plus 1. Okay, and then perhaps we will just look at this as here we have 2x plus 1. And then on the bottom here, work that out, you will get, just multiply this out first. You will get x to the fourth power plus 2x to the third power and then plus x and then plus the 1 right here. So just multiply this out, so you get the x squared squared, you get x to the fourth power, and then 2 times this and that, that's how we get a 2x to the third power. And then lastly, it should have been your x squared, so this right here should have been x squared. And then we have the 1 from here, so that's that. And now we have to make sure that this right here is decreasing, so that means we want to look for the place that this right here is less than 0. So in fact, the critical number that we care is the top is equal to 0. So we care about 2x plus 1 equal to 0, meaning x has to be negative 1 half. That's the number that we care. And in fact, the bottom, notice the bottom is always positive. Why? Because we have this quantity squared, so it's non-zero, right? And then if you add 1, yeah, this is never negative. And if you add 1, yeah, for sure, yeah, it's always positive. So just care about the top. And then if you do the first derivative test, right here, x equals negative 1 half, pick a number less than negative 1 half, let's say negative 1. Put it here, you get negative. Pick a number bigger than negative 1 half into here, you get positive. And we're looking for the part that's negative, so we just need from negative infinity to negative 1 half. So answer choice A. Okay, number 11. We are going to find the dimension. This is the optimization question. Find the dimension of the rectangle of the largest area that has space on the x-axis. So let me just write down the largest rectangle of the largest area that has the base on the x-axis and then the two vertices above the x-axis and on the parabola right here. All right. So let's go ahead and write down what we know and draw a picture if we need to. The parabola 12 minus x squared looks like this. Right, just x squared is open up and negative x squared is open down. And then 12 minus x squared is just you drag it up 12 times so it looks like this. Okay, so let me just put down a picture that say we have a rectangle right here, somewhat like this. And now let's do some labeling. Remember, from the y axis to the right hand side, this is just the x. And then this right here is the y. Good. 
and if you want to get the whole area it's the whole thing from here to here that's 2x all right so what do we know though we know the relationship between y and x we know y equals 12 minus x squared so that's very nice and what do we want to know here we are trying to find the biggest area so we want the max of what the area and the area of the blue rectangle again is 2x right total base times the y and now before we take the derivative make sure that you put this into here so we have just one variable so we get area as a function of x equals 2x times y which is 12 minus x squared yay and then we see that area is just multiply this out we get 24x minus 2x to the third power perfect now take the derivative we get 24 minus 6x squared and then we are going to set this equal to zero and so for x and you will see that critical numbers just move the 24 to the other side divide the negative 6 on both sides you get x squared is equal to 4 and you take the square root on both sides x is equal to plus or minus 2. hmm which one do we choose well negative x will give us the picture right here and in fact if you put negative x into our area equation you'll get a negative area so the value that we carry is only positive 2. all right now let's just go ahead and make sure that this does give us the maximum so i will just do the first derivative test right here when x is 2 the first derivative is 0 and then when x is less than 2 let's put it into here work that out you get a positive result pick a number bigger than 2 put it here work that out that's you will get negative and then you say something like because since the first derivative changes from positive to negative at x equal to 2 so that's a maximum all right and then to answer the question we are trying to find the dimension right so we know when x is 2 what's the dimension though let's write this down carefully remember it's 2x so 2 times 2 is 4 and then by how about the y well we know when x is equal to 2 y will be 12 minus 2 squared just work that out that's 12 minus 8 so y will be equal to 4 no 8 I was thinking about yeah so 4 by 8 and again it's 4 because this is 2 times x which is 2 times 2 and then the 8 is because the 12 minus the 2 square for the y so I think that should be pretty clear okay number 12 we are going to sketch a graph of a continuous function on the interval so make sure that the graph is continuous on the interval negative infinity to plus infinity and with all these conditions hmm so let's go ahead step zero draw our x and y axis the first number that we care is negative 2 because he says so we want to have f of negative 2 is 0 so I'm just going to come here and I say here is my negative 2 and I must the graph must cross this point all right next right here it says first derivative is less than 0 for all x so I will just write this down because the first derivative is always less than 0 
This means f is always decreasing. F is always decreasing. Okay, so keep that in mind because when you have a decreasing case, you may have a curve that looks like this or looks like this, or I can either go like this and then change concavity, right? So I don't know yet. Okay, as we can see the second part right here, it says, so the next part says, the second derivative at negative two is zero. Oh, so you can expect maybe you get a point of inflection. In fact, it does, because right here it says, the second derivative is positive for x is less than negative two. But it becomes negative when we have greater than negative two for the x. So this right here means f is concave up for less is for x is less than negative two. So I will graph the curve like this. I'll put this in blue. So concave up and decreasing. So that will be this picture here. Concave up and decreasing. But afterward, it becomes concave down and decreasing. So F is concave down. So the picture will look like this. Concave down and decreasing like that. So that will be a picture. So that, that should be pretty good. Now that's it. Yay. Okay, number 13. We are going to calculate this limit. So first off, we see that we have two natural logs. And in the middle, there's a subtraction. So what we can do is just combine them first. So this right here is equal to the limit as x approaching 1, positive. Put them together, we just have ln of inside divide, right? So x to the 7th power minus 1 over x to the 5th minus 1. Yay. And how do we deal with this kind of limit? Well, I'll tell you. Whenever we're taking a limit, you can just do this inside out. So in another word, you see how we have the ln right here. Let's just put the ln on the outside now. And then look for the limit of the inside. So the limit as x approaching 1 plus, And we look for x to the 7th power minus 1 over x to the 5th power minus 1 like this. So just look at the limit inside out. And if you put a 1 into all the x's, you will see that you get 0 on the top and then 0 on the bottom. But it's okay because we can use L'Hopital's rule here. So I will just say thanks to the 0 over 0 case, we can use L'Hopital's rule here. Again, you keep the ln on the outside and then you just look at the limit inside. So this is the limit as x approaching 1 plus. Go ahead and take the derivative of the top. That will give us 7x to the 6th power. And take the derivative of the bottom. Again, you get 5x to the 4th power. Just take the derivative on the top and also on the bottom. Very nice, huh? And then if you put 1 into all the x's, it's just going to be 1. So you don't have to bother to simplify the powers. You don't have to. So in fact, you just get 7 over 5 inside, don't you? And we still have the ln on the outside. So here we have ln, and the inside is just 7 over 5. And guess what? We are done. Oh, I don't even need this much space. Okay, and that's it for this one. So perhaps I will just put this more toward the middle, just to make it look slightly better. Okay, yay. Number 14. Okay, if 1200 centimeters square of material is available, to make a box with a, square, with a square base and an open top, find the biggest possible volume of the box. So this is an optimization question. Let's go ahead and put down what we know. 
we have a total of 1200 centimeter square of material that means the surface area and when you want to draw when you want to create a box you start like this first this is the base which is square based so it will be like this and then you must have four sides like this so that later on you can just fold up the sides and you can make it into a box and now let's just put down some variables let's say for the square we have x and x for each side and for the height we don't know so that will just call that y and y and if you fold this up you can see that here's the 3d picture the base is x and x and then when you fold this upward like this the height will be for the y so that's how a box can look like good so what do we know though first off i will just kind of put this down a little bit because we are given the surface area it has to be 1200 so for the surface area first off we must have x squared so we must have x squared and then we have to add well this right here is x times y because this is x and then here is y so x times y and then we have four of them so one and then this is another one and then another one and then one more so together we have to have 4xy and that should be equal to a total of 1200 so that's what we know now what do we want to know we want to get the biggest possible volume so we want the max of the volume and how do you find the volume of this box well this is just x times x times y which is x squared times y cool and now we can proceed right now let's just do the usual procedure here i'm just going to look at our constraint equation and then solve for y by doing so i will have to first minus x squared on both sides so 4xy equals 1200 minus x squared and then divide the 4x on both sides so y equals 1200 minus x squared over 4x and i'm going to put this into the y here and then we'll end up with the volume in terms of just x and that's x squared times the y and that is 1200 minus x squared over 4x and notice we can simplify this a little bit this and that cancel out pretty nice and then i will just distribute the x so let's see firstly we see that 1200 over 4 is 300 300 times x we get 300x that's the first part then we take x times x squared so that will be a minus and then we have x to a third power and then remember we still have to divide this by 4 so i will just put down a 1 over 4 right here so just simplify this a little bit and you will get 300x minus 1 over 4 times x to the third power then we can proceed by taking the derivative and we get 300 minus 3 over 4 x squared and then we are going to set this equal to zero to find the critical numbers and this means we will get um, let's see okay i'm going to put this to the other side i'm just going to write this down this is 300 equals 3 over 4 x squared and then here multiply both sides by 4 over 3 just be really careful with all these fractions and all that stuff so cancel everybody here and then we get x squared equals reduce the right hand side we get 400 this means x is equal to plus or minus 20 but negative number here doesn't make sense because we're doing geometry so x should be 200 uh, x should be 20 and you should verify this real quick and you can just provide me a first derivative test right here real quick i'll just say v prime 20 you know it if you put a number less than 20 
into the first derivative, you should get positive and then negative afterward. And you can say something like this. I'll just say V prime changes from positive to negative at x equal to 20. So that's going to give us a maximum. All right? And then finally, we're going to just answer the question. And we're trying to find out the biggest volume, right? So all I have to do is just go ahead and compute the maximum volume is going to be a fee when x is 20. And uh, I will just plug in 20 into the volume equation, which is right here. So 300 times 20 minus 1 over 4 times 20 to the third power. So 20 here, 20 here. And then you can use a calculator to do this real quick. Or you can just work that out by hand. Up to you. And I get 4,000. And let's put on the units. This is the volume. So it's centimeter cube. So this right here will be the maximum volume. I'll just box this. I'll just box this right here. And then we are done. All right, number 15. We are going to find the critical numbers of this function. So just go ahead and take the derivative, set equal to zero, that's all. So here we go. First derivative, well, be really careful. This is to test your derivative skill. We have two functions. We keep the first function, which is x squared, multiply by the derivative of second. Derivative of e to the y over is just e to the y over. But then here we have a negative 3x, right? So multiply by the derivative of that, which we multiply by a negative 3. Then we add the second function, which is e to the negative 3x times the derivative of the first, which is 2x. Okay, we can factor out e to the negative 3x. And then for the first part, we get negative 3 times x squared. So we'll leave that. And then we add it with 2x. Okay, and then again, we set this equal to 0. So we have this times this equals 0. We should put e to the negative 3x equal to 0. But this right here is not possible. No solution. So we really have to focus on negative 3x squared plus 2x, make it equal to 0. And to solve this, we can factor out an x first. And then we get negative 3x plus 2 equal to 0. First answer is x equals 0. And the second answer is you solve this, so you put this equal to 0, you will get 2 over 3, positive. So these are the only two critical numbers, and they are on the domain of this. There's no, you know, it's not a tricky question here, so that's it. Sometimes if you solve the x, right, but if these numbers, they are not on the domain of the original function, then you don't consider them as the critical numbers. Yeah. Okay, number 16. Uh, we are going to sketch the derivative. This is similar to one of the multiple choice questions right here, right? But the key here is that notice the slope of the tangent line here is not defined negative infinity technically, because you have a vertical tangent line. However, if you look at this right here, the slope right here is like negative 1. So that's the difference. That being said, I will start with that right here at 0. The slope is like somewhere down here, negative 1. And then it's going to be more and more to flat like this. So like this. And then right here, it's almost close to zero, likewise here. So the picture will look like this.
yeah, done. And if you would like, I will tell you the graph, <laughs> this right here, the equation I use is negative inverse tangent of x. And I should just um, tell you, just put a little note. F of x here is the negative inverse tangent of x. So the derivative should be negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. And if you graph this on a calculator, you will get that. But you don't have to know this. But you should recognize it, though. All right. Last question. Related rate, right? So here, at noon, ship A is 100 kilometers west of ship B. And then ship A is going south at 40 kilometers per mile. 40 kilometers per hour. And ship B is going up north at 20 kilometers per hour. How fast is the distance between them changing at 4 p.m.? And is the distance between them. Okay, so draw two pictures. Let's say originally, this is at 12 o'clock, so let me just say 12 o'clock here. Let's say here is A, ship A, and here is B. Okay, what do we know? B is going to go up, A is going to go down, right? So A is going to go down, and then B is going to go up. And then right now, they are exactly 100 kilometers apart. So that's all I know for now. And then let's look at at 4 o'clock. Well, originally, we'll still have this distance, 100 kilometers. And then which one is going faster? A is, right? A is going 40 kilometers per hour, fa and that's faster than 20. So I will put A a little bit more down, and let's say B is just somewhere here, all right? So as you can see, we create this kind of picture. These two distances are changing, so I'm just going to label them as variables. I will label this as capital A, and I will label this as capital B for their distance. And now the question is asking the distance between the ships. So what we care about is the distance from here to here. How fast is that distance changing? As you can see, originally it's just 100 kilometers apart, but then of course data is going to be like this, and then like this, and so on, so on, right? Okay, so I will call this red part C, of course, capital C. Mm, but as you can see, we have two right triangles. No good. But don't worry, you can look at this as one right triangle, because this right here is B, where we can also say the same thing right here, right? So we can just move that to the other side. This right here is also B. And then this right here is 100, but we can also put the 100 right here. And the 100 is always 100, so I can write that down. So that will be the picture. And now, what do we know? Well, as you can see, this right here is just A plus B for the whole side. So we know that A plus B for the whole side, and then we have a right triangle. So we know A plus B squared has to be added with the 100 squared, so that we can get the hypotenuse squared. So yeah, Pythagorean theorem. So that's what we know, and um, we also know the speed, don't we? Because right here, when he says A is sailing south at 40 km per hour, this tells us the ADT is equal to 40. And notice this right here shall be a positive 40 because the distance is getting bigger and bigger. Similarly, the BDT, this right here, is 20. So 20. So that's all we have so far. And then what do we want to know? We want to know the change of distance between them, so we want to know dc, dt at 4 p.m. At 4 p.m. means, um, what's the distance for A? Well, from 12 to 4 o'clock, it has been 4 hours. We can just go ahead and multiply its B and also the 4. So 40 times 4, that will be 160. And then for the B, it will be just 20 km per hour times 4, and that will be 80. Okay, so far so good. 
And now you can just look at this equation and take the derivative with respect to time. You don't have to multiply this out because we can use the chain rule. I think it's easier that way. So I will write this down right here. And then take the derivative with respect to time. If you multiply it out, you will get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And then you see that 2ab, you have to use product rule. So it's easier if you just do it like this. All right. Put the 2 to the front, minus 1. We first get 2, and then a plus b to the first power. And then we multiply by the derivative inside, which is just the derivative of the first part, right? dA dt plus the second part, dB dt. And then the derivative of 100 squared, that's just a constant and zero. <laughs> then lastly, the derivative of c squared is 2c and then dc dt. Okay, so we can get rid of this 2 and 2. That's good. And then now we can just draw numbers. a is 160 plus b is 80 times dA is 40 plus dB is 20. Yeah? And then that's equal to... Oh my god, we still have to find out C. But don't worry, because we can use the Pythagorean theorem right here. So for C, I'll put this down in green. Just go ahead and drawing these two numbers into here, right? So we are looking at 160 plus 80 squared plus 100 squared equals C squared. So that's 240 squared plus 100 squared. And it's a 5, 12, 13 triangle. But just to make things simpler, you can just say this is c equals the square root of 160 plus 80 squared. So I'll just put it as 240 squared and then plus 100 squared. You get 260. As I told you, it's the 5, 12, 13 triangle, but you just double it. So you get 10 and then you get 24 and then you get 26, right? And then you multiply by 10. So you get 100, 240 and 260. All right, now we know c is equal to that. So I will just put down 260 times dc dt. So ladies and gentlemen, dc dt is equal to, you take this divided by 260. So this right here is about, ready? 55.4, because it's 3 eighths, so it's 4. And now we'll do it. And that's the change of distance over time. So that will be kilometer per hour. So that will be the answer. And this is a positive number because the distance is getting bigger and bigger. So yeah. So that's it. That's the test right here. And hopefully this right here helps if you are taking Calc 1 or if, if you are taking AP Calc. If you are a teacher, Feel free to use this with your t students as well. And I will also upload this solution to my Patreon. That's all.